a quirky little question, but down where the towers fell, is there a, any distinctive smell to this day? Uh, not anymore. Not anymore. No, not anymore. You can't. You don't smell it. What did happen after the towers fell? About several months after, a lady had come down there because the smoke smelled awful, and she said, "I know what the smell is. I was in a concentration camp that's burning flesh." So for about two weeks, you could smell this bizarre, awful smell. But the, the dust had its own inherent awful smell. It was, you couldn't breathe. It was this fine, fine powder. What they did was, when they did an analysis of the powder and they put it under the microscope, the only thing that was even comparable in terms of the fineness was Mount St. Helens. That's how fine it was. Now, I'll point out some of the danger or some of the stuff that happened. There was not, now every tower, both towers had fluorescence on every floor. Every fluorescent has mercury in it. There was not a single fluorescent bulb found intact. Every desk has formaldehyde in it. There was not a single desk found, in, excuse me, found intact. And every computer, in those days they had the fat screens, had about two pounds of lead in it. There was not a single computer found intact. So all of that mix was in the air, and that's what the guys were breathing. You know, I'm happy to say I didn't spend the whole, I didn't do 16 hours a day. I, didn't, wasn't, I was down there several, multiple times, but I wasn't there as much. I wasn't exposed to all this stuff. But our guys, the police, the fire, the rescuers were exposed to this constantly. The dust was so bad that when you went down there, it would accumulate up to your knees in your clothing. And they had baths that would wash your feet. Sometimes you would get a, um, a, a hazmat suit, sometimes not, because there were just not enough of them. But you, they would wash your feet, you would hose them off, or you'd change your clothing, because they didn't want you bringing this stuff home to your kids and to your family and stuff like that, because th this stuff was as toxic as it gets. So the early reports that the air was safe to breathe, it, the air wasn't even safe to eat. It was really that bad. So did they take the 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 remain uh, the cleanup? Did it go to some lined uh, waste disposal, like with a lining so the lead and everything wouldn't hit the groundwater, or did it get mostly washed into the river? Or what they they would wash it with the um, with the sanitation trucks that they used the street to clean the streets three times a day, and that's all they did. So. The stuff eventually dissipated, either blew away or they washed it into the East River, into the Hudson River. But there was no specific, there was so much of it that you couldn't put it in dump trucks and you didn't know where to put it. All the big stuff went to the Staten Island landfill. It, it was all in Staten Island. That's where I saw the uh, engine. Um, would you care to show or share what kind of injuries you sustained? Or? Yeah, I got hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I could complain all day, but uh, you know, as a, you get you, I, I got all my ribs crushed. I got my back smashed. I, I was bleeding. Um, I couldn't breathe. Uh, it, you know, I got my head crunched a little bit. But uh, and I got a, a big burn from the uh, heat from the jet fuel in my sinuses that caused all kinds of complications in the future. So I had sinus abscess and things like that. But uh, I'm not here to complain or to even ask for sympathy. Uh, I'm here to remind people of what went on and to share with you people exactly what it was like and, and the fact that we're all in it together. Hey, you, may not, you may not know for sure, but uh, what percentage of the um, 343 uh, firefighters was in the basement of the number one tower when it went down? I, I don't know what percentage were in the, in the it, it actually was the ground floor, not the basement. But uh, they, they were, almost all of them were killed in Tower 1. It was really, because that's where they had responded. In fact, the high command of the fire, fire department were all down there. So all the chiefs, all the captains, they were all wiped out. They had never, ever experienced anything like this. The highest commanding officer afterwards was a lieutenant. The fire commissioner was with Giuliani, as was the police commissioner, so they survived. But all the bosses were in the, in the, ba uh, in the base of the tower. For the firefighters, or did it obviously changed, and what were those changes? The, you're talking about the injuries? No, for um, protocols so like uh, when they would bring in people with mass with mass destruction like that, um, how do they proceed with that? 
Well, now what they do is, in, in terms of mass injuries, is again, they, they did it starting then. Giuliani managed to do it. What they did was they assembled in a distant site and they would notify every hospital cleared out their emergency room. So all the emergency rooms were empty, waiting for survivors. There were no survivors, hardly. There were only 20 people pulled out. And actually, in terms of me, there were only 400 people admitted for more than 48 hours to the hospital. Most of the people were killed, and there were only a very small number of us who actually spent any time in the hospital. The, the worst injuries were the jet fuel that burned the people, and they ended up with third and second degree burns, and massive burns, some of them went up to the burn center. But each hospital was designated as to what it was going to receive. And the hospitals, not only in New York City, but in New Jersey and in Staten Island and in uh, Long Island, were prepared to receive people with the expectation, and it was wrong, that there would be a lot of survivors, and there weren't. So what, now what they do is it's the same sort of thing. In a mass casualty situation, you empty the emergency rooms, you notify all the places, but the big change, biggest change after 9-11 was that the police department and fire department radios talk to each other so they can communicate. But that was never even thought about. People never even considered that. The other change is if they hijack your plane, fight them. Don't sit and do it. And they didn't know that until the, the, the fourth plane, which was attacked in Pennsylvania, and by then, they knew that this was going to be an attack, and the word went to fight them. And that's how they prevented hitting the Capitol or the uh, White House or whatever it was. But the first two planes, the hijacker said, just sit still, you'll be okay. They knew what was going on. The other thing is, in that first picture, they used box cutters to hijack the plane. Because you couldn't bring a gun on a plane, but you could get on with a box cutter. And now you I didn't originally know about the 20 survivors, but are you the only, are you the sole first responder surviving? Who survived? No. Were, oh, there, I, were there other first responders that survived? Oh, a lot of, most of the first responders survived if you were outside. No, I but, mean of the 20. Uh, well, I, I pulled myself out, so I was different. I, I wasn't pulled out of the rubble. I actually had to dig myself out of the rubble, but in terms of the, the, the 20 people, they were literally dug out of the wreckage. One of the people I worked with, her cousin was a firefighter, <coughs> excuse me, and she went down there that night, and he was one of the only first responders who survived. Most of the first responders were outside and weren't killed, but those were the numbers of the people who were. The big loss were young people who worked for Cantor Fitzgerald. That, the picture with them above that smoke was probably Cantor Fitzgerald employees. They were all young. They had all left that morning to go to work. I'll see you later, dear, unless I don't. No one expected this. And, and they were all young entrepreneurs. They were working for investment companies. They all had big mortgages in New Jersey. They all had obligations. They all had young kids. Moira had a two-year-old. Moira's daughter just turned 18, and they had a ceremony for her and all the other stuff. But she never got to know her mother. 20 people um, is in both towers together total? Total. To in that ruin, total. 20 people out of that rubble. And that was it. From both towers? From both towers. Were you able to continue your practice? I stopped on September 10th after I took out two gallbladders and I never resumed surgery. And I was a consultant for a while. I found that I broke my back. And it, it was hard to stand, and I don't think anyone wants a surgeon who doesn't want to stand and pay attention. So I thought it was sort of a signal to stop, and I became a consultant for a while, and then I had complications. I was in and out of the hospital for a while, and uh, I stopped, and I do other things. I wrote my book, and I play, and I have great times, and I work with Elaine, and we long distance communicate, and we do stuff like that, and I travel, and I can't complain. Life's good. You know, I... I Happy to brag, I survived. You know, I made it. And I, I don't consider myself a hero. I consider myself someone who did what I'm supposed to do. And that's part of the contract. When you take a job in medicine, you do that. All of you people know what you have to do in life. Someone's in trouble next door, you go help them. Simple enough. That, that's what life's about. That's why, otherwise you wouldn't be here in church and you wouldn't be here caring about people. And that's what it's all about. You know, there's no written law that says, you, you, you know, it's going to be easy. 
but you sure enough got to do it. I'm telling Timmy, who did my roof, you know, he responded because he had to. So about 9-11, uh, we did a presentation, and I have several friends who have been a part of 9-11, but not in 9-11, but were in New York at the time, and they could hardly even talk to me because they were crying. And they, uh, they watched the video conference that we did, and they wondered how he was able to talk like this and not have PTSD and those types of things. And so how do you do that? When you're a surgeon, you deal with tragedy. You see people die. You see people bleed to death. You tell people they have cancer. You tell them that this may kill them. And you put it at arm's length, and you see it in the reasonability of what life is about. No one gets guarantees about anything. And it's, I think, the same thing with me. I can see it for what it was worth. I can see it, what, what it did. Obviously, it affected me. It changed my life. It changed my career. It changed my ability to operate. But it also changed my outlook. And I think each of us who goes through tragedy, you either let it win or you beat it. And I think I beat it. So one more thing, does anybody have any questions? I want you to just real quick, tell them about your presentation in Long Island at the school and the 15-year-old girl. Tell them about that story, because that gives me goosebumps. This has nothing to do with that. Well, it has a little to do with 9-11. Uh, I grew up in Long Beach, Long Island. If you read my book, you'll see uh, I had a good time in Long Beach. Long Beach is on the very south shore. And one of the things I do now is I come and I talk to students, and we talk about anything they want to talk about. And they asked me about becoming a doctor and becoming a nurse and all these things. And I said to the kids, one of the important things you could do, even at your age in high school, is learn CPR and learn first aid. A few of the kids thought that was a good idea. And last summer, they took CPR and first aid. One of the kids told me that over the summer, her father collapsed, had a heart attack in the house. And she did first aid and she did CPR. And she resuscitated him. And the wife called 9-11. When the ambulance got there, they said, based on his rhythm and based on the, the amount of damage he had, if she hadn't learned it, he would have died. So what she did was she saved not only her father's life, but she saved the family, the father who's still alive and still well. So she told me this, and I said, well, I guess it's all worth it. It's really a pleasure talking to you, all of you. You know, if you get a feel for what it was like, I didn't bring it here to shock you or anything like that. I just want you to get a more of a first-hand understanding of, of really what the city went through. But not just the city, but everyone went through. This is America. And although you're in South Dakota or wherever you are, this affected your lives as much as ours in different ways. But it changed the way you travel. It changed the way you go. It changed the way things are. It's, it's why when you go to New York City now, you see armed guards. It, it, was not, it wasn't always like this, but it also changed the way people think about each other. And either you care for each other or you ignore each other. And really, that this is what it was about. After 9-11, the city was gloomy. The city had the smoke, and the city was dark. But people cared about each other a lot. Everyone hugged you. When you drove in, and I drove in multiple times. I actually had a cop driving me around because I couldn't drive. But she would drive me in, and... People would wave to you. They'd hold up signs, thank you. It, it was just that simple. And, you know, the other thing that happened was all these conspiracy theories, uh, none of which are true. Uh, you can re-examine it. You can say that uh, anything you want because you can't go back and look. But these didn't blow up. And th these weren't done by George Bush. And they didn't kill all these people because n America wanted to do this. Th this was done by evil people who had the wrong direction in their, their minds and their lives. Uh, is it understandable? I don't, I don't understand why. Uh, it makes no sense to me. It never did. But it happened, and we go from here. You know, people hurt people. On the other hand, more people helped people. And really, that's what it's about. It's not about the bad guys. The bad guys will always be there. It's about the good people. And, and that's, that's what 9-11 was. It was about these heroes who, at the risk of their own lives, not even knowing what was going to happen, came in to save and to help people. I find this extremely <laughs> interesting. We didn't have a TV in those days, and so I didn't see these pictures or pictures of 9-11 probably a year or two later, you know, and I had been watching a, a video, and I said, wow, and that's what it looked like. Well, one of my brothers was one of the first responders at 9-11, and... He was part of the Type 1 team, 
in the Forest Service, and so they were the first ones on the mound, is what they called it. And we called it the pile, actually. The pile, yeah. yeah. And being the only engineer in the group, he was given the job of surveying the whole thing. And he stayed there for a month or more, and he was part of the dispatch team in the Type 1 team that provided all the supplies that the, the first res or the people who were working the pile had to take care of. And, you know, he would put a call out to different companies and say, you know, we need this supply. We need boots. Generators, the guys, boots, yep. The guys who were up there on the pile trying to clean it up, their boots would just be torn to pieces because of the metal. And so they'd put a plea out, we need boots. And one of the things was, we need Vicks Vapor Rub. And the guys would put that on top of their, no under their nose so that they couldn't smell what they were smelling. But just different things, but how people rose to the occasion, which we always do, we can watch in Houston, we can watch in you know, these hurricanes, people want to help. People are there to be a part of trying to help and change what's going on. And anyway, the experiences that he had during this time, this is very moving because it gives me a little bit more glimpse of what he had gone through. He became very close to the first responders, to the fire people and police department because they had to work um, so closely together to try to help um, take care of all the needs that were there. Anyway, I just want to thank you very much for coming because it has helped me and I, it's very encouraging that you know, our country is a great country. And we do have enemies, but we st stand strong together. I, I really thank you for that. And I think that's what it's about. It, it's really about, it's not about the bad guys. It's really about the good guys. And there were, the, the first week, we had 14,000 responders from all over the country. People on September 12th got into buses from Oklahoma and from North Dakota and from South, and from everywhere, from Texas. From South Carolina, they would come up, and you'd see these hordes of people who came up to help. I wasn't there. I, I didn't get out of the hospital until the following week. But by Monday morning, I had to go down there. They asked me to come down, and I, I couldn't breathe. But uh, somebody dragged me down there, and I did what I had to do, and I was still responsible. And there were just hordes of people, none of whom just attacked it, none of whom did until they were told what to do, and they stood by but we're here to help you. Home Depot sent in every generator they had in the entire metropolitan area so they could relight the place. Um, a good friend of mine, who happens to live in Florida now, uh, was the chief engineer for Ericsson. And he went on September 11th from Poughkeepsie, New York, which is about 80 miles, 70 miles, something like that. He drove down with an antenna so he could start restoring communication. The feds sent in troops. There were troops everywhere. And it was really a, a mystery, but it was an organized mystery. Now, no one knew exactly what to do, but they did it, and, and it got done. And it took them forever to get it done. It took them, like I said, they poured water on it from the Hudson continuously until January when it finally went out. 